Hi, this is Tim Santoni, and welcome to Santoni Spotlight. Today we're joined by Chris Trombley. Chris, thanks so much for joining the show. Appreciate you uh, stepping in. Thanks for having um, me. You're welcome. Looking forward to be a YouTube sensation. There you go. Um, before we get started, Chris, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what it is you do, where you work, so the viewers just have a general sense of, of what expertise and what information, what point of views you're coming from today. Sure. So I am a property and casualty insurance broker with a focus on the food and beverage industry. I lead our food and beverage practice. That is everything from farms to processors, manufacturers, retail, and restaurants. And we focus on the space of about 20 million to 250 million in sales. Wonderful, wonderful. And and what? how did you end up getting involved in, not so specifically insurance, but the food aspect of insurance? Like, what? how did you get to that point? Everybody likes to eat, so it's not something that's going away anytime soon. <laughs> but it was something that was a pain point in the insurance marketplace. The insurers were pulling out of uh, working on fresh food, ready-to-eat food in the produce space, in the um, seafood and meats. So there was a, a need for somebody to step in and learn about food safety and be able to educate the insurers on what makes a good risk and why they can be profitable on food companies. So you're obviously very passionate about what you do and the food business, but what do you love about the fact that, you know, that, that aspect of the business that you're really focused on the food and how food's made process? It's, uh, it's constantly changing in terms of the regulation, in terms of the science behind it. So being able to go to the classes and learn about what the new standard is, what are companies trying to achieve, if they need to get into Costco, if they need to get into Kroger, uh, Stater Brothers, whomever uh, it may be. So there's always something new to learn, there's always something new to engage the clients with, to engage the insurance companies with, and make sure that we have the best possible program at the best pricing for the client. So what you're saying there is that you have some impact and help them actually get into market based on certain regulations and, and more of the business practice than just strictly the insurance side. Is that accurate? That's exactly it. We have clients or prospects that we'll go out to and they say, don't bother going to some certain insurance company, a group of insurance companies, because they always are declined by them. And we say, give us a shot at it. And we present that insurance company with information they've never seen before, and they might not only change their opinion of bothering to provide a proposal, but they'll price it very aggressively on top of that. Very good, very good. So as you're working with these companies, maybe give us a sense of like the top three mistakes or things that, that maybe they're doing wrong that they could tweak. You, may, you alluded to something there that seems super important, which is having the right data, but what are the things they're doing wrong that are maybe impacting their ability to get insurance, their premiums, uh, other things that, that are impacting their overall insurance you know, costs? It's a lot about how the, the broker vocalizes or paints the narrative of the company. So that bakery, that restaurant, that co-packer might be doing all the right things, but unless they're asked to uh, obtain all the food safety information, the recall, the traceability data, and have that information um, aggregated and boiled down to something that the underwriter can digest, then the narrative's not going to be correct. It's not going to be full is really a better way to say it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really the broker's responsibility to lead the company to what they need in order to produce the best possible result. Um, but some companies do need some more sophistication in their food safety, getting compliant with uh, the current federal regulations under FDA or getting a past a Costco audit or a third party food safety audit. And we have some internal and external resources to be able to help them through that. Mm, great. So, you know, when, when people hear what you do in terms of being an insurance and working in the food, what are they, give us a sense of like the top three questions that somebody will ask you to kind of lead you down the road of kind of either being a prospect or a client. Um, they're like, hey, well, maybe I need to talk to Chris. Like, what, what are they asking you? Um, they ask about food experience because a lot of a lot of professionals in general, not just insurance brokers, will say, oh, I, I specialize in the food industry. And if they say, well, tell me about it, and they say, well, I have three or four clients in the food business, and that's not really enough, and that's not necessarily genuine. You have to be engaged in the the trade shows, the education experience of it, um, learning online and in any area that you can to build up your knowledge and be able to have a real conversation. So it's not that every CEO and CFO will understand everything about quality control within their food safety plan, but they know enough um, to engage with us and to see that we have some unique both experience and education in that to produce a better result. Makes sense, that's great, yeah. So it sounds like you're painting the picture and then telling the carriers the real story and helping pull out the data that maybe 
is present with the business, but they're not documenting it or, or uh, showing it properly in a way that's presentable for, for the purposes of modifying that risk. Exactly. And the insurance companies have taken some very large losses in food. So they're going to be um, very careful about what they're going to take on in their book of business. So it's, an under, it's understood that why they have this reaction to it. It's just a matter of changing the underwriter's perspective that this particular group that we're presenting to you is better than all the rest. Gotcha, gotcha. So when would, when would someone know they need your help? I mean, what, at what point in the process is it they've been turned away? Is it their rates are going up? Like where, when do they know, gosh, maybe that the, the broker that I'm with or the, com the, the carrier that I'm with is maybe not the right fit for my company? It's, it's a hard thing to know because most uh, business owners or the CFO even doesn't spend an awful lot of time getting into the minutia of the insurance coverage to know where there's weaknesses. But they generally see increases or um, stagnation in their program that the first year a broker was in there, they had all these ideas and they were bringing all these services and that has dwindled and dwindled to a point where they're only seeing a broker at the renewal time, sometimes just a couple of days before a three or $400,000 renewal decision. Wow. So they, they start to see that there's, maybe they should be taking one of these calls or accepting a referral. And oftentimes they're with a generalist insurance broker, which isn't necessarily bad, but when somebody says, hey, can I introduce you to somebody who knows the food insurance space and knows how you operate and can paint you a little bit better to those insurance companies, that's a pretty good conversation to have. Gotcha, so you hit on something there about brokers only following up prior to renewal. So give, maybe give our viewers a sense of, in your practice, whether you or anyone on your team, how many times per year are you having touch points and meeting with the client? It seems like you're super involved, but maybe give us a contrasting view of, you know, the typical view of like, you know, month before renewal versus, you know, yeah. actively involved in their business and their risk management. Oftentimes, it's however much they let us. Um, we we want to be involved uh, at least on a monthly basis in something proactive, not just here's a certificate that you need or um, here's an auto ID card or something like that. We want to be engaged in developing a plan. Workers' compensation is one of the heavy areas of insurance that needs a lot of touch points. Even if, if the company is doing well and not having many claims or not having a lot of litigation in their claims, if they keep steady with that, they're not going to progress and they're going, something's going to happen with them. That's just the nature of the Southern California. So we are constantly introducing new ways of shaping safety incentives, uh, engaging employees, having supervisor, commu supervisor communication trainings, um, bringing in OSHA experts to be able to help them if they were to have some nasty loss or get an anom anonymous report that they will pass an OSHA visit audit um, with a high degree of certainty that they'll, they'll come through without penalties. And then on the other side of it, the liability auto. Um, liability is something that they, it, it's, it's not something that's going to change for them unless they have a real reason to do it. They're not going to comply with very high level of um, food safety changes unless they're forced to by a customer. So when they tell us we've been trying to get into X retailer and we haven't been able to do it, we can bring in a resource to get them to where they need to be. And that generally helps them with their liability premiums. And lastly, the, on auto insurance, that's kind of the new workers comp, the premiums are skyrocketing. Sure. So if they don't have a, a written program that the drivers sign off on, trainings for the drivers at least once a month, even uh, GPS devices, telematics devices inside of the vehicles, they're going to lose out on certain credits that'll keep their premiums under control rather than skyrocketing just like most other companies out there. Hmm. I wasn't aware of that, it's interesting. Yeah. Makes sense, so adopting technology and other things to protect the insurance company makes sense for the insurance company and they can penalize you, right, if there's non-compliance. Right, right, and these systems are relatively inexpensive and so it's a, it's a low level of investment, but they get information about the driver's habits, whether they're turning hard, whether they're speeding, whether they're stopping for too long. So this is a lot of good information to have. Also, too, in our experience doing investigations on the claim side, when you have a commercial policy in place and you have a truck, a food delivery truck with a big name on it, yeah. the inherent thing is is that there's they should have a higher level of safety and a standard. They're a commercial driver. They drive more. And they're inherently going to be blamed more because the, <laughs> the, the perception is right that there's um, dollars on the other side that can that can insulate and protect and, and sure. you know uh, yeah. that are available and so they have to do whatever they can to 
create a defensible claim with through cameras and other things that they can do to say, look, this wasn't my fault. Right? That's right. Because they're going to say, well, it is your fault, and they're going to get involved and be in, on the hook in some way, shape, or form, likely. Yeah, the last thing you want is just finger pointing. If you have hard evidence, you're going to make your case much, much better. Exactly. So I, give maybe give our viewers a, a, a sense of a, maybe not a, it doesn't have to be a recent success story, but a client story where you kind of got involved, implemented some of the things you're talking about, and had some impact, whether it was in their bottom line, their overall security and safety in the business, um, or help them get into maybe uh, you know another business opportunity that they weren't able to before they started working with you. Sure. So we just we have a, a new client that is a uh, fish distributor based in, in Vernon, and when I was referred into them, they had showed with me that they've had a long term relationship with the broker, but it, it had gone stale. They're not getting really any input. So our usual process is we we do an interview and start collecting some data about food safety, about driver safety, about um, general hazards in their operation, and then we audit their insurance policies. So in the audit, we're trying to cherry pick on things that we know are very important with food companies. It could be spoilage coverage, it could be uh, utility coverage. Is, is there coverage so that if power goes down, they're going to get income back from their insurance policy? Um, and oftentimes we see these that there's, there's either nothing there or there's a tiny fraction of insurance which is not going to help them. So we come back with a report saying, here are the six or dozen areas that we think are high profile things that need to be changed either at your renewal or really now. And whether you want your broker to make those changes or you want to uh, enlist us to make it happen, we just want to bring this to your attention because it's, it's truly alarming. And oftentimes these changes cost nothing. They're just a matter of engaging with the underwriter to make that tweak to the policy that makes it react the way the employer expects it to react. So those are um, a couple of just kind of low level things that we start. And with this, with this fish company, it was, it was the exact same situation they had. Lots of areas of insurance that they thought they were covered, but they really weren't when you got into the insurance. They are selling mostly to restaurants, but they want to get into retail. So they, they need to get, step up their food safety program significantly in order to get there because they need to comply with new regulations. If they want to start importing from other countries, there's different um, measures that need to be adopted to verify that the foreign suppliers are compliant with U.S. standards. And we're going to be, over the next 12 months, helping them along with that, paying for some outside services to come in and, and assist with that, as well as introducing our own services for OSHA compliance, driver training, um, wage and hour events so that they're clock-in procedures are uh, going according to California law and they don't get sued, or if they do, they're going to pass that with flying colors and not have a whole lot of outlay for it. Wow, that's a great example. You're pretty much getting involved in all different areas and helping them stay compliant and probably mitigate exposure they probably didn't know they had and probably you know get some coverage for, for those things that they thought they had coverage for, which I think is very typical, right? No one reading those contracts in depth and not reviewing them carefully. And at the end of the day, it helps me go home feeling satisfied that I did my job right and I can sleep well at night and be good to my family knowing that, uh, that I've, I've done everything I can to help my clients the right way. So Chris, thank you for sharing a lot about what you do and your clients. Before we let you go, we like to ask a couple personal questions. So sure. we're gonna uh, ask, uh, you, know, you know, when you're not spending time on the insurance side, you know, tell us a little about your personal life. What do you like to do in your spare time, hobbies? You know, what, what are you doing outside of work? I've got a four month year old, or four month old baby and uh, two, almost three year old uh, boys. So we've got a couple of boys and my life just revolves around them. So I'm excited every day to come home and get um, some time in between when I get home around six and when they go to bed around seven or eight. So I just fill the, that with as much time with them as I can. Um, when, I, when I have some me time, um, it's usually finally getting a chance to be with my wife for a little <laughs> while. <laughs> Even if it's just you know, watching a movie together or talking about what happened during our days, it's, it's just precious. Um, but some of the things that I, I've done in my life that I love doing, car racing is, is the big one. Um, I got involved about 10 years ago in, in bringing my own car to the track and I've, I've had many different cars that I've taken out there now and it's just, it's a thrill and it's had to be curtailed since the kids came along but every once in a while I get out there, even with a few Provisors members. Nice. And then I play the drums. Oh, wow. I uh, started playing when I was about 13 and um, had to back off when you get older, you get houses and your neighbors don't really like drums. but. <laughs> have an electric drum set now to be able to turn it down a little bit or use headphones and it's great to be back into it. Very cool. Yeah. So uh, 
favorite app or favorite book that uh, you've came across in the last 12 months? Uh, I do a lot of Audible because I'm in the car okay. all the time. So. I enjoy Audible myself. Um, what's one of the best ones? Uh, Beneath the Scarlet Sky. It was a really fascinating book about a subject that I didn't know much about. It was a perspective of a young man in Milan, Italy, as um, the Nazis were occupying that area, and then the Allies were encroaching and encroaching. And this is an incredible story of this young man who ended up shepherding out um, some of the Jews into uh, Switzerland, and it, just this incredible series of coincidences that happened to him that give him a, such an unusual story. So I absolutely love that book. I recommend it to anybody. Awesome. Well, Chris, thanks so much for time spending with us and with our viewers. We will definitely link up all of Chris's contact information in the show notes below. And I encourage you guys, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments, and uh, we'll make sure that Chris gets back to you. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Chris. Thanks for having, having me. me. It's been fun.